lovely to see you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, yeah, I'm going to be reading from April. Um, and this collection kind of encapsulates a time in my life that was dominated by an eating disorder. Um, but eating disorders aren't really about food and eating, they're about lots of other things, so naturally the collection talks about lots of other things too. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read for you is for a friend of mine, and it's called Eloise. <coughs> I ate toast with the girl before she was habituated. Let her plait my hair, her front teeth denting her bottom lip. Daytime TV. The girl still a girl when she tapped out of this world at the barrier. Riding a child's fur, she split open the tube map and found an exit wound her ending body around a carriage, like string noosed around a finger, a method I learned for memory recall. Everyone has at least once felt the brutality of calendars, their indifferent turning of pages. A sharp tug on a string on a finger brings pain, movement, Twitching back into grey matter. I'm trying so hard not to forget Eloise. And I understand why I didn't ask who found her. Whose intrinsic muscles were plucked at by her face. Didn't want to know which stop she ended the trip at. Call me selfish. I don't want to know when I'm passing through her deathbed, her dad seemed so collected in the debris. I didn't want to imagine him crumpled, trackside, saying, yes, that's her, or it was this time yesterday. Um, yeah, so the, the next few poems I'm gonna read come from the third section of Apricot, which is a longer sequence. Um, so the poems all function together um, and the title of this section is a question. Um, is your illness old enough to hold a sentence, to drink from a beaker? And this section talks about the experience of being hospitalised for an eating disorder and tries to convey the kind of faceless psychiatry you find yourself up against in the odd little bubble of society it is. Um, and this is the closest I've gotten to explaining it. In June, the doctors write with bad news. I don't think the pain is muscular. I think the binder will be having an effect on your posture, your perception, an ability to breathe and stand up straight. Because of the weight, the density, the lack thereof, because of the pain and aerated marrow, the obvious malnutrition you have performed. We expected the alkaline in your blood vessels, the way your ribs often crack on windowsills. We can see your lungs trying, lighting up in the results. Your waning bones scanned flat as a piece of paper. In the real world, it's easy to be worrying, to keep a hungry waist and prove really how little a person can become. There's nothing special about being thin here. Everybody's sick in a hospital. We do our crochet in armchairs, get taught how to stretch, how to sit down, over and over to our two rich tea biscuits and two small satsumas. How to pronounce I need. After ward round, the doctors relay clean plates are an expectation. 
and your frail heart when you stand is alarming. We've noted how your elbows stir at night, hourly in the torchlight. The team can see how hard this is. This week, we grant you fresh air, watercolours and clay, clear medicines that fizz in a road like spirits. Think about harm reduction, which care pathway beckons. You can stay here as long as you need. On both the night and day shift, the nurses have become hardened to the horrors we spell out so laboriously with our skeletons. Our metered jumping jacks, the clogged strains we splash about in, the childish acts of our made childish bodies. Twice weekly, poker face. They write down our measurements, the bleak flesh we indulge in, and catch us out when they look up from the numbers to us. Is there anything else you have to say? Inside, summer's over, and I'm still so far away. Haven't been through my own front door in months. Haven't paced in anyone's kitchen. Instead, I'm sitting in an armchair, watching a TV rippling from inside a sealed cabinet, nursing a full stomach and the kind of memory that pops a jar like a fridge. In session, the psychologist says, this time, after you leave us, how will you tell people when you aren't okay? And I've been in here since beetroot season, should be home by marrow. If I keep scraping the yoghurt from the pot and talking about the flashbacks of greedy hands, the size of the cereal box, the quiet things that make us look the way we do. I listen to thin women advise each other on how best to eat Kit Kats and do other good things with their lips. I want to feel intact. On readmission to the real world, the doctors write, together we've interrupted the dying, mitigated the illness, which you found simultaneously empowering and calorific. Acknowledging a degree of ambivalence, unforeseen luck, a series of collaborative meals. You want to be home more than you want to be thin, despite complex, intense and changeable maladies. Reluctance, you have restored some body. We admire your decision, that you've made one. We've made no adjustments to the contingency plans. We can only give you your last hot lunch, the first week's worth of medication. The risk of relapse, as always, will put high, though we are hopeful we won't be seeing you again. Inside the hospital, she had told me apples get their calories from sunlight, churning it under the skin. And who can tally that? All the warmth in apple learns, a crisp and bee, a glow turned mouthful. What guilt is there in fullness that started out so bright? Thank you. 